Far East Broadcasting Company Philippines in partnership with Green Hills Christian Fellowship Ortigas bring you a message from the Word of God. Together, let us know Christ and make Him known. Morning Church family. Welcome to the first worship gathering for today here in Green Hills Christian Fellowship in case you are here for the first time. And I'd like to encourage us to take this time to say and extend that good morning to the rest who are here. Uh, do stand at this point. Take this time to maybe look for the person farthest to you and shake that person's hand. You can also just smile or bump that person's fist and may we consider it a blessing to yet again worship the Lord in spirit and in truth even as we do so through song let's bow our heads in prayer and begin this time by simply reading from God's Word Isaiah 43 verses 11 to 13 says I am the Lord and besides me there is no Savior I declared and saved and proclaimed when there was no strange God among you and you are my witnesses declares the Lord and I am God also henceforth I am he there is none who can deliver from my hand I work and who can turn it back Lord of hosts Father Son and Holy Spirit this morning we say we are in awe of who you are and we thank you that we can simply respond to your presence to your renown to your holiness in utmost worship so receive O Lord the praises of your people for we pray these in Jesus name Amen uh, we'll read aloud and study together Joshua chapter 9 please open your Bibles if you need a printed Bible there are also a few in the hall uh, in the worship hall you will read from Joshua chapter 9 verses 1 to 6 and then we read verses 22 to 27. Let's all stand in reverence to the Word of God. Joshua chapter 9, verses 1 to 6. Joshua chapter 9, verses 22 to 27. Let's begin. As soon as all the kings who were beyond the Jordan in the hill country and in the lowland all along the coast of the great sea toward Lebanon, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Canaanites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites heard of this. They gathered together as one to fight against Joshua and Israel. But when the inhabitants of Gibeon heard what Joshua had done to Jericho and to Ai, they on their part acted with cunning and went and made ready provisions and took worn out sacks for their donkeys and wineskins, worn out and torn and mended, with worn out patched sandals on their feet and worn out clothes. And all their provisions were dry and crumbly. And they went to Joshua in the camp of Gilgal and said to him and to the men of Israel, We have come from a distant country, so now make a covenant with us. Joshua summoned them, and he said to them, Why did you deceive us, saying, We are very far from you, when you dwell among us? Now therefore you are cursed, and some of you shall never be anything but servants, cutters of wood and drawers of water for the house of my God. They answered Joshua, because it was told to you, to your servants, for a certainty that the Lord your God had commanded his servant Moses to give you all the land and to destroy all the inhabitants of the land from before you. So he feared greatly for our lives because of you and did this thing. 
And now, behold, we are in your hand. Whatever seems good and right in your sight to do to us, do it. So he did this to them and delivered them out of the hand of the people of Israel, and they did not kill them. But Joshua made them that day cutters of wood and drawers of water for the congregation and for the altar of the Lord to this day in the place that he should choose. May the Lord add blessing to the reading of his word. Please take your seats. Let's keep our Bibles open. And let's welcome back Pastor Larry. Good morning, friends. It's good to be back here and... Uh, so good to see all of you again after being away for about three consecutive weekends. As you know, I attended uh, two consecutive trainings. The first one was in Capitol Hill Baptist Church in Washington, D.C. That's by Dr. Mark Dever. Uh, and that is about how to run a church very biblically. I was with 30 other people from Europe, from Asia. I had a fellow Filipino there, uh, the son of uh, Dr. Norma Bernardina and then also from North America. And after that, uh, my wife and I, we went to Ligonier, and uh, she was also able to attend with me. And I would like to take this opportunity to thank you. You made it possible. And I also thank our board of elders and deacons who actually prefer that if your pastor is away for a week or more, my wife should be with me. I think that's, on, that's not only practical to keep me morally upright, it's also because she also got a lot, especially from the Ligonier Conference. So thank you very much for sending me away on that. But you know what? Nothing beats coming back here and seeing all of you again. So please open your Bibles with me as we continue our series in the book of Joshua. If you were here two weeks ago, you were listening to Pastor Noel speak about the reaffirmation of the covenant. By the way, I always watch. Even though I'm away, I make sure to watch what goes on in here. And uh, that was a great sermon, the reaffirmation of the covenant. And Pastor Noel spoke to you very clearly about what constitutes the covenant. It's binding. You cannot just walk out of it. And then Elder Dan gave us a great sermon, remember, about the defeat of Joshua and, of course, their recovery in the debacle and then the success at the city that is called I. Now, we will look at the right pronunciation in a while. But our message today is the continuation of our series in Joshua. And what you will see is that uh, you find out how true this is, even in your own life. It is usually after a victory. It's usually after a victory that defeat sometimes will be most possible for us. Like in our story, friends, what the, what the enemy of God can do with us is often most damaging right after we have been through a major victory in our lives. So let me just enumerate what happened. For example, it was after the victory of Jericho that I defeated Israel. It was after defeating I that the Gideonites in our story today deceived Joshua. Now, I know you're saying, Pastor, how do you pronounce that, that city-state AI? Now, phonetically, Elder Dan was right. It pronounced Ayi. But linguistically, if you listen to a Hebrew audio Bible, it's two syllables, a-ai. Not, not very nice sounding, no? a-ai. So we will be Gentiles, not Hebrews today. Let's just use the word ai, okay? A-i is pronounced ai. Uh, not, we'll not use the Hebrew pronunciation. And that was very significant because after that victory, uh, now they will fall into the deception of the Gibeonites. So you know what happened? Well, they were at the mountains of uh, Ebal and Gerizim. Most likely, the six kings were talking about, let's form an alliance. Because if we do not form an alliance, this, this Israel will wipe us out. So while they were perhaps renewing their covenant with God, it's very possible in Joshua 8, 30 to 35, the kings were getting ready to attack. But you'll find out the alliance did not push through. It didn't. And Israel would succumb, would actually fail, not because of their combined military might. In our story, they'd fail because of deception. And you know what's useful here for you and me? The same tragedy can happen to us. The tragedy of deception can happen to us, dear friends, if we're not careful. If we walk by sight and not by faith. Let's begin with a word of prayer. 
Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for this opportunity to look at your word today and discover that ultimately you are the main character of this story again. It's not even Joshua. It's not the Gibeonites. It's you, Lord. Help us see more of who you are. See your character, your attributes, and see above all the greater Joshua in the midst of the story that a human Joshua could fail. As great a leader as he was, he failed. But the greater Joshua who would follow him, the one who never sinned, the Joshua named the Lord Jesus Christ. Not only would he never sin, but he would bear our sins on himself on the cross. May we exalt him today, Father, and give glory to your name. And may we see how important it is that we walk by faith, not by sight, and learn, learn from the narrative today how to go about that. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. What is the danger of walking by sight? Why is it dangerous for you and I to walk by sight? Well, friends, we all need the guidance of God. And we must look at the danger of walking by sight because without God, you and I are easily deceived. We might think, well, I'm making a very well-thought-out scientific decision. That's what probably Joshua thought. We're proceeding based on knowledge, proceeding based on science. This is logical. This makes sense. And they failed. They fail horribly. You know who taught us to depend on the Lord and on ourselves? That was the Lord Jesus himself. Do you remember what Jesus said, beloved, in John 15, 5? Jesus said in John 15, 5, apart from me, you can do nothing. We must walk by faith, not by sight. And I want you to know, common sense and the Holy Spirit do not have to contradict each other all the time. Science and God don't have to contradict each other all the time. But the problem is when we rely on common sense or street marks or science instead of God, which is what happened in our story. Then you'll have problems. So please open your Bibles with me to Joshua chapter 9. If you're using our pew Bibles, I'm on page 222, and we'll tackle the whole chapter, all 27 verses up to page 223. And I want to read for you uh, or summarize the first two verses, friends. The first two verses talk about the time when six city-states, they're the Hittites, the Amorites, the Canaanites, the Parasites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites. It says, the, it says here, they heard of this. What this? The defeat of Jericho and I. Uh, you know, put yourself in their, in their shoes. Uh, you hear of this, this, this certain powerful city-state named Jericho. And how were they defeated? Well, a certain, you know, upstart nation called Israel circled around their city for seven days. And then suddenly, the walls collapse, and they're defeated. Can you imagine going up against an enemy like that? Obviously, there is somebody very powerful behind them. The same for I. They will hear, oh, I defeated the Israelites because they sent a very small contingent. Oh, they got defeated. And then you learn uh, later, oh, wow, they wiped out I from the map. So you hear this, and you're one of the six city-states. Now, I want you to remember, friends, this enumeration of all these ites, uh, they're not really nations like nations today where millions of people are. They're more like the Vatican. Their city states. There are perhaps several thousands of people. They're not millions, maybe 7,000. Jericho is estimated to be around that uh, number when it fell. Perhaps the same for Gibeon. And they were saying this Israelite is not their number. They're not winning because of their number. There is something behind them. And maybe they had an idea what it was the God of Israel. So they said, let's combine forces. That's how our story begins in verses 1 to 13. And in your outlines, friend, I have to correct a, a typo. It's the creators, not the creation. This is about the people, not the event. The creators of deception are tackled in verses 1 to 13. So six city-states say, let's combine our forces. What happened? Verse 3, but when the inhabitants of Gibeon, who are these people? They're the Hivites. 
Remember verses 1 to 2? Six city-states, one of them are the Hevites. The Hevites are the, the tribe behind Gibeon. The Hevites back out. It says here, when the inhabitants of Gibeon, who are the Hevites, heard what Joshua had done to Jericho and I, they acted with cunning. So what happened? They came up with elaborate and well-contrived measures to trap the unsuspecting until it was late, too late. I want to summarize what they did two ways. One, they used props. Look at your Bibles. What props did they use? It is very nicely enumerated there how, how, how much effort they went through. The props are worn out sacks for donkeys, a worn out, torn, mended wineskins, worn out sandals, worn out clothes. Friends, you do not come up with this in one moment, right? So my, my imagination is running. How did they come up with this? Maybe they announced throughout the whole of Gibeon. Uh, can we ask for volunteers? We will pay you money. Give us your worst looking clothes. You know? Uh, the, the worse they look, the better. The smellier, the better. Uh, give us your worst sandals. The bigger the hole, the better. What else? Give us your worst looking sacks for our donkeys. And... and Wineskins. It's very hard to come up with wineskins like this. Why? They throw them away. So maybe they announce throughout Gibeon. Let's come up with these wineskins. And maybe the people were wondering, what's wrong with our leaders? Why are they asking for wineskins? Because they would have an elaborate plan. Props, friends. And they will use this together with bread, which is easier to come up with, that was dry and crumbly, maybe moldy. Takes us a few days, as you know, for bread to appear like that. But props, and then a proposal. Look at the proposal they have in verses 4 to 13. And this proposal, I want you to know, it sounds very simple. It's genius. It's genius. It reflects research. They did their job of trying to find out how can we trick Israel. Because it's very possible, Bible scholars tell us, it's very possible they did their homework. They research what will keep Israel from slaughtering us like they slaughtered Jericho and I. And maybe, very possibly, they read or at least asked what God told Moses. Because God told Moses, Moses, when you enter the promised land, you tell the Israelites they are to be instruments of judgment. They are to skill Every city-state in the land of Canaan, because that belongs to you. Number two, they're under my judgment. You are my instrument of judgment for their idolatry because they did not repent after 600 years. And number three, very practical reason, you have to wipe them out because they're squatting on your land. It's your land, and they'll kill you if you don't kill them first. But God gave Moses an exception, except, except for lands and countries very far away from the promised land. Then you can have a treaty with them. It is believed the Gibeonites knew this. That's why their proposal is genius. Look at your Bibles. This was their proposal. We have come from a distant country, so now make a covenant with us. It shows prior knowledge of God's instruction to Moses that you do not kill those who are from distant countries Instead, make a treaty with them. Now, let's look at the details. I want you now to look at the proposal here I read through is the executive summary. But look at how they actually implemented the proposal. First was a lie. A lie. Short statement, but a lie. They said to Joshua and his leaders, we come from a very distant country. Your servants have come. From a very distant country, your servants have come. Now, why is this a lie? You know how distant Gibeon was from Israel? 25 miles away. 25 miles away. You can walk that in one day. In about eight hours, you can walk 25 miles if you walk very slowly. If you walk very fast, you can do it in even less than eight hours. They were just 25 miles away. But what did they do? That's the lie. And they combined the lie with the longer statement, which is true. Uh, the truth is, they said, because of the name of the Lord your God. For we have heard a report of him and all that he did in Egypt and all that he did to the two kings of the Amorites, to Sihon and to Og. This is truth. Does this sound familiar to you? It's almost the same words that Rahab said when she came to faith in the true God of Israel. 
they're actually saying, and it, perhaps you can even imply, we can't be sure, perhaps you can even imply, they were almost at the point of also believing in the true God. Because their words are almost exactly the same words of Rahab when she said she had put her faith in the true God of Israel. So this is truth, a long statement of truth combined with a very short lie. Why am I making a lot of this? Friend, that's how deception happens to believers today. If you, will, if you are fond of scrolling to the internet, I pray you are not, but it's almost useless to say you don't, because I know most of us do. There are so many things there that will destroy you if you're not careful. And I'm saying this with a heavy heart. See, there's more than one person I have personally worked with in our midst. I tried very hard, very, very hard to convince you have to stop watching this YouTube videos because one of these persons would send me this YouTube uh, videos or talk to me about these blogs and say, Pastor, here's the link. Click it. If it's a blog, I'm fine. I can read the blog very quickly. But when he sends me a YouTube sermon that's one hour long, I tell him, I don't have time. I, I tried listening to them. I could not stand it. False teaching. And you know what the characteristic of false teaching is? Don't try this at home, okay? Very short statements of lies. And very well couched. You almost will not catch it. And then the rest of what they say, 95 to 99% is true. But if you swallow the whole thing, the lie will eventually become more powerful than the 90 to 95 percent that's true, which is exactly what the Gibeonite did. Short lie and long statement of truth. Friend, that's false teaching and false teacher. Please, I plead with you, stop watching YouTube videos. Stop reading blogs if you have not yet familiarized yourself with the basic truths of the word. Have your own personal quiet time. If you need help, ask your elder, ask your deacons, ask your pastors. But please stop spending so much time on the internet. There's a lot of garbage there and much of it is poisonous. You might say, I, oh, I, I know my doctrines, pastor, uh, because I'm a GCFer. Diba? If you come from GCF, you're solid in doctrine. Friends, these people I'm talking about were long-time GCFers. And they've left the church. And one of them I kept trying to convince, stop doing that, go back to your Bible. Eventually, before he left our church, he said, I don't believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God anymore. It broke my heart. Please, stop scrolling to the internet if you have not yet grounded yourself in the most basic doctrines of our faith, which we keep trying to remind you of. If you're not in a growth group, it's very, very recommended to be in one. Why? You can ask your growth group leader, but faster. Uh, sometimes he tells us honestly, I don't know. It's fine. You ask your fellow growth group members, what do you think? Our growth group leader said he needs more time. They might know. But at least you're part of a group where you're accountable. And you're part of a group where they can tell you, will you stop reading this famous book? It's a lie. It's written by a false teacher, a prosperity teacher, written by someone who believes in attractional ministry, which is not the way God wants ministry done, and so on. So friends, I'm saying this passionately because I don't want to happen to you what happened to those two or three GCFers who until now have never returned, no longer with us. They no longer believe in the most basic doctrines of our faith, including that Christ is God the Son. They do not repent. I'm almost sure they will not be welcome in the kingdom of someone they do not believe in. So beware, my friends, the creators of deception. Their methods bear a strong resemblance to that of Satan and false teachers today. In 2 Corinthians chapter 11, 13 to 15, Paul was talking about such people. He said for such men. Who are the men he's talking about? 
These are what Paul called the super apostles. Paul wrote the entire 2 Corinthians to defend his ministry, among other reasons. Because there were this group of false teachers who were very, apparently very brilliant, very eloquent, very influential, and had penetrated the Corinthian groups of churches. You see, when Paul wrote Corinthians, he was not writing to one church. It's probably a group of house churches. And the super apostles had started to influence them. Basically, they were saying, look at us. Look at Paul. We're doing the same things. We're also teachers. But they were saying we're better than him. You know why? Look at his life. Look at all the suffering he's gone through. Is that something you want to believe in? Somebody who keeps suffering? They were discrediting Paul. So Paul wrote the book of 2 Corinthians to talk about his ministry, not because his feelings were hurt, because he was writing Scripture. His writings would become part of what we call the New Testament. He had to defend his ministry. And so 2 Corinthians eleven thirteen to 15, he said, Such men are false apostles, deceitful workmen, disguising themselves as apostles of Christ. And no wonder, for even Satan disguises himself as an angel of light. So it's no surprise if the servants also disguise themselves as servants of righteousness. Friends, we are in a war. We are in a spiritual war. Your enemy is brilliant. He has got several thousands of years of strategic learning under his belt. You think you have an MDA, you have a PhD, he's got several thousands of years of experience. And when he uses people, he transmits to them all his learning, his knowledge, his powers. He's able to transform himself in what we read in 2 Corinthians into an angel of light. He's fond of using people who are influential or famous or well-connected to distort the truth and deceive people. If the Gideonite deceived Joshua, with their props and proposal, beware, beware. There are false teachers who could deceive you today. You must know the Word of God. And let's now look at the second part of our story, the cause of deception. How in the world could somebody as well mentored, well instructed, you know, as faithful as Joshua, how could he fall for this? Hook, line, and sinker. How could he do this? Well, I want to look at three minor contributory things and then the main thing. But three minor contributory things. One, it says in verses 14 to 17, they tasted the provisions. What does it mean? Well, this is the story, okay? So they go to Joshua. They have the proposal. Uh, Sir, look at us. Don't you feel sorry for us? I'm paraphrasing, okay? That's not what they said. But they came to him with what? Worn out clothes, perhaps very smelly, you know. So maybe Joshua was saying, okay, what are you saying? What else? Look at our clothes, look at our shoes, look at our wine skins. These this were all new. What were they saying? It took us several months to get to That's how far we are. A lie. Okay? And then finally, when they say, look at our bread. This was freshly baked. Now it's dry and crumbly. Actually, they were just 25 miles away. Maybe it took them, you know, six to eight hours to get there. Maybe even less because they were riding. And what did Joshua do? They sampled it. That's what it says in verse 14. They sampled it. They were trying to be scientific instead of spiritual. And there's nothing wrong with science. You know, I've been grounded in science for most of my life. I have nothing against it. But the problem is when you rely on science instead of God's spirit. They don't have to contradict each other. We can be both. That's one. Number two, if those were true ambassadors with authority, authority to conclude a treaty with another sovereign state, you know, they should have had more impressive bearing, right? I mean, if I was Joshua, and you know, we're geniuses in hindsight, no? Anyway, I would have said, you're saying you're ambassadors of, of, of your country? Why do you look so, so bad, you're so smelly? You're saying you traveled? Why didn't you reserve one set of clothes for our meeting? What am I trying to say? It's like this. If I came to you wearing my favorite shorts at home, you know, and my favorite shirt. What's my favorite shirt? It's well ventilated because there are holes in there, you know. You'd say, Pastor, what's wrong with you? 
Why are you preaching in those clothes? You're not credible. That's what Joshua should have done. He should have said, I don't care how far you come from. You're supposed to be ambassadors. Why don't you reserve a set of clothes just to meet with us? That's the second. Number three, Joshua was naive in not perceiving if it's true that they were hundreds or thousands of miles away. Why the need for a treaty? Right? Hindi ba? Why, why do you need to talk with us? We're not even going to reach you to take us a lot of time. We're not going to bother with you. So these are minor contributory things. But the main thing, the main reason for the cause of the deception is verse 14. Look at your Bibles. They did not ask counsel from God. You know that God speaks directly to Joshua, right? Or sometimes he speaks to Joshua through the priest. Maybe through the Urim and Thummim, which we don't know what they look like. But most of the time, as you know, God does speak directly with Joshua. It says here, they, he, primarily as the leader, the box stops with him, did not ask from God. That is the danger of walking by sight, not faith. We must beware of depending on our wisdom. Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. You probably have memorized this if you have. You're very wise. I want you to remember Proverbs 3, 5, and 6, if not word for word, at least thought for thought this way. Look at the first part of it. The first verse, verse 5, is easy to remember thought for thought if you look at the two phrases there as mutually exclusive. If I trust in the Lord with all my heart, I will not lean on my own understanding, correct? If I trust in the Lord with all my heart, correct? But if I trust in the Lord with some of my heart, I'll say, you know, I trust God. But, you know, just to be sure, I will still depend a little on me. So they're mutually exclusive. If you trust in the Lord with all your heart, you will say, God, if it kills me, I'll trust you. That's Job. Though he slay me, yet will I trust him. So that's verse 5. What about verse 6? Again, it's an easy way to remember verse 6. You remember it as cause and effect. Look at it. In all your ways acknowledge him. What happens? That's, if that's the cause, what will happen? The effect is God will do his part. He will make straight your path. That's a figure of speech to say, he'll guide you. What's the opposite of paths that are not straight? Crooked. These are difficult ways. It's saying God will guide you so that you might encounter difficulties, but he'll never leave you. He'll be with you. So that's Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. And friends, we must beware of depending on our wisdom because this holds true for believers today. The New Testament application of Proverbs 3, 5, and 6 is James 4, 13 to 15. James was warning against those who were very, very self-assured. He said, Come now, you who say today or tomorrow we will go into such and such a town and spend a year and year there and trade and make a profit. He said, you do not know what tomorrow will bring. What is your life? You are a mist that appears for a little while and then vanishes. Instead, you ought to say, if the Lord wills, we will live and do this or that. James is not against planning. Could we be clear? He's not against it. He's against not trusting God and presuming on God. That's what he's trying to say. Don't make your plans as if God does not exist. That's what he's trying to say. What is the attitude that assumes God must be consulted? It's there. If the Lord wills, we will live and do this or that. So we will consult God. After we consult God, guided by Him, we will plan. And after we have planned, we will continue to trust God. That's how you plan as a Christian. Consult God. Make your plans as God gives you wisdom. And after you make your plans, continue to trust God. God is not against planning. He is for it. But you begin with consulting him. That's how it goes, my friends. It wasn't, friends, that Joshua didn't think, but it's that they didn't pray. 
They did not have because they did not ask. That's James 4, 2. You do not have because you do not ask. It reminds us of 2 Corinthians 5, 7. For we walk by faith, not by sight. It reminds us of Proverbs 14, 12. There is a way that seems right to a man, but its end is the way to death. What is the implication for us? It's obvious. In any decision you and I must make, ask God first. When you have asked him, then you proceed with the wisdom he gives you. And as you proceed, you continue to consult him. And then if need be, friends, you seek counsel from people who value and honor the word of God. So ask God in prayer. Now that we have the Bible, you meditate on the word of God. It is the basis for your life and your plans. And then, especially if it's a major decision... You involve people who value and honor the Word of God. Why am I saying this? I know these are basic things for knowing the will of God. Why am I saying this? Because if I have a bias, if I have an agenda, I can actually use my, for example, my Bible reading to justify my agenda. You know, for example, if I hate somebody in church, and I do not want to forgive and let go, even though I know that disobedient and rebellious to God, You know what? I will do my quiet time. Lord, I really cannot forgive this person. I really do not like him. If I see him on the street, I'll cross to the other side. Something like that. Is there anything in the Bible? I'm not saying that, but it's in your heart. That will justify. Oh, look at this imprecatory psalm. See? I have a justification for refusing to forgive this person. Look at the psalmist. His heart was broken. And he said, God, will you rain down all these things on him or her? You see? So even our quiet time, be careful. Be careful. That's the Word of God. The Word of God is always true. The Word of God will never lie, but we can make it say what it's not saying if I have a bias. So it's important, aside from prayer, aside from meditating on the Word of God, if it's a major decision, seek counsel from people who say, I believe in the Word of God. It's inerrant. It's infallible. It's authoritative. Let's talk about it. You want guidance about this decision in your life, about career, about marriage, about ministry? Let's talk. Let's pray. You seek counsel from people like that because sometimes our sinful nature might actually make us think God is saying something He's not in His Word. Okay? The cause of deception is put here to warn us we must walk by faith Not by sight. What are the consequences of deception? Painful, friends. I want to summarize 18 to 27 in terms of the painful consequences. One, there was potential conflict in Israel. What does verse 18 tell us about? The people. The people went to Joshua and grumbled. It's dangerous. Remember how they did that to Moses and led to mutiny and uh, even a coup d'etat against Moses? That was the beginning here. This is the first time in the whole book of Joshua that it says the people started to grumble against Joshua. And Joshua is a good leader. He was far better than even his mentor, Moses. But here the people are complaining. See, this is a problem which was caused by walking by sight, not by faith. Number two, for the Gibeonites, because they were lying con men, friend, there was perpetual slavery for them, which is summarized in verse 27. Uh, Joshua uh, really put a, in a sense, a curse on them in verse 27. Okay, you deceived us. You got away with it. We're not going to kill you because God told us to wipe out those who live near us, but we're not going to kill you. But from here on, you'll be servants at the altar of the Lord. And number three, next time you look at the book of Joshua after Father's Day, you'll find out there was pressure to war on behalf of the Gibeonites. In Joshua 10, 4, the other nation, remember the six nations? The other five said, this Gibeonites, they refused to align with us because they had their own plans. Let us wipe them out. That's what happened in Joshua 10, 4. They would go to war against the Gibeonites, and because Israel had the treaty with them, they were forced to defend the Gibeonites. Of course, God would use that to create a miracle and a win for Israel, But that was a problem imposed on Israel by their being deceived by the Gibeonites. 
But I want to end on a positive note, friends. Our final thoughts is, how does grace overcome? First, God showed grace to Joshua despite his error. I believe God permitted Joshua to make a mistake. God could have prevented it. God could have told Joshua, Joshua, don't listen. Don't listen to the Gibeonites. They're going to, to, you know, to put the wool over your eyes. They're going to put one over you. But God allowed him to make a mistake. Why? Because, friends, Joshua is a prototype, a foreshadowing of another Joshua. In fact, this Joshua would be the greater Joshua. If this Joshua in our story made a mistake, he was given grace because he needed grace. He was not perfect. He was just like us. But the second Joshua who would come, the greater Joshua, he would never sin. He would die on the cross, not for his sins, but for my sin, your sin, that whoever believes in him will not perish, but have eternal life. That's the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus, as you know, is Greek for Joshua. And Jesus Christ is the greater Joshua, the one who never sinned. But God showed grace to Joshua despite is there. The second way grace overcomes is after receiving grace, after God didn't tell Joshua, Joshua, I'm kicking you out. He never did that. God forgave Joshua this error. Safe to assume he asked forgiveness. What happened? Joshua, as a recipient of grace, showed grace to the Gibeonites. He kept his word despite pressure from the people. And there are two lessons to learn here. One, those who have been given grace must show grace to others too. God forgave Joshua. So what does he do? Okay, give your nights. My people want to kill you because they know that's what God wanted, to kill all those occupying the land in proximity to us. But because I, we gave you our word and involved God in it, we will spare you. Those who have been given grace must show grace to others too. Number two, this is really a very important implication. Whenever you involve the name of God in any commitment, that's called a covenant, you must keep your word. You get me there? Whenever you involve the name of God in any commitment, you must keep your word. Why do we say marriage is a covenant? You know why? You involve God in it. So those of you who attended weddings I've done, you know, 99% of the weddings today are not done at GCN, no? That's, that's surprising. And like my time, when I got married, it had to be in the church. But anyway, when I do a wedding, it's outside the church. I always say, welcome to a Christian wedding. This is not a Christian wedding because it's in a church. That's obvious. We're in a garden. We're at a beach or we're at a beautiful restaurant. We're at a hotel. Number two, this is not a Christian wedding because I'm a pastor. I tell them that. Because I'm also a doctor. It doesn't make these to my patients. Nothing to do with me. Why is this a Christian wedding? Because these two have received Jesus Christ as their Savior. This is the marriage of two Christians. That's why it's a Christian wedding. And then in the middle of the ceremony, I will say to the two, you're going to make a covenant today. This is not just a legal transaction honored by the government of the Philippines. You're making a covenant. Because as Christians, sinasangkot ninyo yung pangalan ng Panginoon. In English, you're involving the name of God here. So groom, when you make this promise to her and you're involving God as witness, it's a covenant. Bride, when you make your promises to him, and because you're a Christian, you're involving the name of God as witness, you're in a covenant. It's a reminder for all of us who are married. However hard your marriage is, you are in a covenant. You honor it. Pastor, I made a mistake. Eh? Nagkamali po ako. You honor it. Stay there. Work it out. Get counseling from our excellent ministry here in counseling. The may is wrong, but don't you dare think that walking out is an option. That's the last option. That's one thing that God doesn't want you to do as much as possible. What else is a covenant ministry? Our volunteers here, I'll remind you, we've been moving away from the term volunteer. You know why? Because volunteer implies 
If I'm in the mood, I will do it. If I'm not in the mood, remember, I'm a volunteer, huh? I'm not a staff, so I'll not do it. So, intentionally, your church leaders, myself, your elders and deacons, have been moving away from the term volunteer and using what? Ministry servant. To remind you, when you're part of a GCF ministry, whether it's inside the church or outside, it's a covenant. You involve God in it. You're in a commitment to God, not just to men. So you're not a volunteer, which for me is not a good term. You're a ministry servant. So no entitlements. Whether your title is staff pastor or senior pastor or elder or deacon or growth group leader, no entitlements. You're a servant and you stay there until God says move. That's covenant, friend. Number three, and we're done with this. Grace from God was finally was given for the redemption of the Gibeonites. Why? Verse 27 says, they were serving at the altar of the Lord, and many Gibeonites would become believers in the true God. In other words, what Joshua intended as a curse became a blessing. Maybe that was part of his intention. Why did he appoint them to serve at the altar of the Lord? You know what happened to the Gibeonites? Hundreds of years later, Many Israelites would turn to idolatry. Because of that, the judgment of God fell on Israel. The Babylonians and the Assyrians would, rem would destroy the nation. And the Babylonians would carry away many of the Israelites into captivity. The Assyrians scattered them. The Babylonians took them away. You know what happened? When they returned from Babylon, many of the Gibeonites continued being Temple servant. That's what they're called in Ezra. And means they didn't just serve. They put their faith in the true God even better than the Israelites did. Beloved, the supposed curse became a blessing. The supposed blunder of Joshua would bless them. Their curse was an act of grace by which many were brought into a relationship with the Lord. Many of the Gibeonites, I am sure, you'll see in heaven someday. What am I trying to say, beloved, spiritually? We're all Rahab, and we're all Gibeonites. Remember Rahab, and we talked about her. We said Rahab teaches us that God's grace is such that he will redeem those that we won't. If you were God, will you redeem a prostitute? Speaking for myself, probably not. So be glad I'm not God. That's God's grace. God's grace is the same for the lying con artist named the Gibeonites who deceived an entire nation. We are just like them, friends. This Gibeonite deceived Israel, but God's grace is such that he redeemed those that we don't. That's Hebrews 6, 17 to 18. Talking about our salvation. So when God desired to show more convincingly to the heirs of the promise, these are Christians, the unchangeable character of his purpose, he guaranteed it, salvation, with an oath. So that by two unchangeable things in which it is impossible for God to lie, we who have fled for refuge might have strong encouragement to hold fast to the hope set before us. When there are times you are discouraged about your Christianity, the writer of Hebrews is saying, it doesn't depend on your feelings. You don't feel like a Christian? He's saying, we who have fled for refuge might have strong encouragement to hold fast to the hope because God has a covenant with us, friends. An oath is God's portion of the covenant. An oath is God saying, Christian? You fell flat on your face. The whole church knows about your failure. People are mocking you. Suppose Christians are looking down on you. You're looking down on yourself. God is saying, I saved you. I will not let you go. That's what it means when you have fled for refuge. It means where sin abounds, grace much more abounds. The Gibeonites were liars, deceivers, and under the judgment and wrath of God, so are we. That's why we're like the Gibeonites. 
Their hope was in a covenant. Our hope is in God's covenant, His oath, His faithfulness. We are sinners and go to a greater Joshua. His name is Jesus Christ. Have you turned to the greater Joshua? Have you put your faith in Christ? Have you entered into the covenant? Why is it then we have, that when we have the cup, we always repeat the words of Christ? This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Because it reflects in our verse in Hebrews 6, 17 to 18. In the covenant we have with God when you receive Christ, he's saying, my oath, my promise is I will never, ever give you up. That's why he said, hold fast to the hope. And that, friends, is what we're talking about. Our hope is in God's covenant. Instead of self-righteousness, therefore, there should only be thankfulness in this. That's Ephesians 2, 12 to 13. Paul first describes what we were before salvation. You were separated from Christ. Alienated from the commonwealth. Commonwealth is community of Israel. Strangers to the covenants of promise. Having no hope in without God in the world. That's the perfect description of a non-Christian. There was a time when we like Rahab and like the Gibeonites were without hope and without God. But look at verse 13. But now, but now in Christ Jesus, you who were once far off, have been brought near by the blood of Christ. Salvation. Have you taken refuge in Christ? Have you put your faith in the greater Joshua? I hope and pray that you have. How can we respond to such a great salvation? Well, respond this way. Help the lost find Jesus. Respond in this way. Build up each other in this community of faith called the church. And finally, if someone in our midst makes mistakes, we never give up on them. Like the Lord Jesus does not give up on us, we do not give up on those who fall flat on their faces inside Green Hills Christian Fellowship. You know why? The world is looking at us. They're looking at, how do you treat people who fail inside your church? If they hear, oh, when people fail inside Jesus, we throw them under the bus. We try to pretend they don't exist. We try to wipe off their memory from GCA. You think the world will want to be part of that? We are worse than they are if that's how we treat people. Friends, when people fall flat on their faces spiritually among us, what should we do? Galatians 6.1. We walk alongside them until they rise again. If anyone is caught in any transgression, you are spiritual should restore him in a spirit of gentleness. Keep watch on yourself, lest you too be tempted. In other words, what does God want us to be? A redemptive community. A place where the broken are healed. Because those who are not as broken as they are will say, we'll walk alongside you. We're here for you. I don't know about you. That's the only kind of church I want to be in. So I don't know, apart from the grace of God, how faithful I can be. And God forbid, but if ever I fail, I hope and pray that this is a church that will say, we'll come alongside you. We will not cast you off to the side of the road. We'll not throw you under the bus. We're in this together. And that's good for all of us. Beloved, let us walk by faith, not by sight. And as re- let us respond to our salvation by helping the lost find Christ, building up each other, and walking alongside the fallen. Let's rise together for a closing prayer. Thank you, Heavenly Father, for our greater Joshua. Thank you for The fact that Joshua is arguably perhaps one of the greatest leaders in the entire Bible. Perhaps eclipsed only by the Lord Jesus himself in terms of leadership. 
But thank you that we see him make a mistake to make us realize there is only one God and one mediator between God and men. Christ Jesus, our Lord. Thank you for letting us see, Lord, that there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. And that is the name of the greater Joshua, the Lord Jesus Christ. Father, help us that as we move from this place today to walk by faith and not by sight. To not discount common sense and science but to always rely first on you, to first ask you, and then as we make our plans, to continually trust you after we have asked you and planned to continually trust you. Help us learn from this, Father, to trust in you with all our hearts, not lean on our own understanding, to acknowledge you in all our ways, and then trust you to guide our paths. Bless your people, Father, with this comforting, assuring truth from your word. We ask this for them, through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. God bless you all. You go with God. You've just heard a message from the Word with Green Hills Christian Fellowship Ortigas in partnership with Far East Broadcasting Company Philippines. We hope you can join us next week. God bless you.